All right, let's pray and we'll start. Lord, thank you so much for your kindness to us. When we think about what it means that you save sinners, we must pause and reflect in awe. Such a staggering task for such unworthy people. As a demonstration of your love, your infinite power, your purposes which bring glory to yourself by magnifying the beauty of your redemptive heart. What amazing things we contemplate, God. I pray that you would protect us from treating these things like some intellectual toy uh, or worse, some theological club to beat people up with. May these truths that we look at this morning ever be humbling to us, the sinners who are hopeless and helpless and dead without your grace. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're continuing our study of the doctrines of grace, and we've summarized five points into three words. God saves sinners. And we began our look last time at the doctrine of limited atonement, or perhaps better termed, particular redemption. Uh, that is, we're looking at what Jesus did in his aim to come and to actually save sinners. And so if we're spelling out the, the flower from the Netherlands, TULIP, uh, we have this acronym, and L would stand for limited atonement. And we looked last time at, at the limiting factors of the at one work of God. What does it mean that God brings people into oneness of relationship with himself? What does it mean that God reconciles people? And we looked at some definitions of some words. Universalism is the idea that everybody goes to heaven. Hitler and Satan included. Universal atonement is the view that Jesus died for everybody in the same way. Uh, a particular atonement or a particular redemption would articulate the reality that Jesus came and laid down his life for his sheep. That is, his design in his death was in accord with the plan of God and the results that that plan sought to bring about. Uh, we looked at universal atonement as an idea, uh, provides salvation as a possibility for some, guaranteed for none, whereas a particular redemption actually guarantees the salvation for all for whom Christ died. And so we looked at the relationship of repentance and faith to these things. I, I want us to think through again just what is it that limits the atonement? In, in universalism, nothing is limited. Everybody goes to heaven. But in every evangelical articulation of the gospel, an Arminian or a Calvinistic or a, a universal general atonement or a particular atonement view, not everybody goes to heaven. There is a real literal hell, eternal conscious torment under the enduring wrath of God, which is the expression of his just and beautiful righteousness in the presence of unforgiven sin. Hell is real. And so when we think about the, the limiting aspects of the atonement, everybody who's a believer in Jesus Christ has a limited atonement in the sense of not everybody goes to heaven. And so the question we're really asking is, is not, is the atonement limited? For one view will limit it in its scope, while another view will limit it in its power. The question we really want to address, I think that gets more at the issue here, is the question, for whom did Christ die? And so on the, on the screen there, we, uh, we looked at a couple of bridges. You can skip to the slides of the bridges. The first bridge there is the Universal Atonement Bridge. It's great. It's big. It's beautiful. It accommodates uh, all and world. That is, it accommodates every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. Everybody can get on that bridge, but the bridge doesn't get one all the way across the infinite gap between sinners and a holy God. The second bridge we looked at... Boy, that's just beautiful with the sunset. Sunrise, what is that, west coast? That would be sunset. Uh, it just looks nice in that picture. The Golden Gate Bridge gets all the way across the gap, right? And that is a picture of not everyone who ever lived past, present, and future on that bridge, but believers on that bridge. Jesus' sheep on that bridge, the ones for whom Christ died, their salvation is not a possibility. It is a secured and guaranteed actuality in the articulation of a particular redemption. So that's the second bridge. 
We then moved uh, last week and we just really began at looking at some passages that articulate a particular redemption. That is, these are statements all over Scripture that articulate the reality that Jesus died for some, or Jesus died for many, or Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. Now, all of these are in the notes, and those are available. If you want to text me, email me, you can get the, the, the notes on here and have all of the references. But for this morning, I just want to read some of these phrases that come from these passages Um, I'll list a verse and I'll read a phrase from the verse and we'll walk through a number of these. Um, And we just want to kind of soak these in. I I wouldn't want you to get carpal tunnel syndrome trying to write all these down. They're available for you uh, if you reach out to me by text or email. Isaiah 53, 8 says that Jesus was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of his people. Isaiah 53, 12, he bore the sin of many. Matthew 1, 21, he will save his people from their sins. That's different than saying he will provide an opportunity for everybody to be saved should they one day come to the realization that they need it and embrace it by faith and repentance. Uh, No, this statement in Matthew 1 describing the ministry of Messiah says he will save his people from their sins. Uh, That is a statement, a declarative statement from God of what he has planned to do and what he will actually do through the death of Christ. Matthew 20, 28 says he gives his life as a ransom for many. A ransom is the payment of a price uh, used in the slave trade, the payment for a person by a purchase price redeeming them out of slavery. Uh, Jesus gives his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus describes the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, This is not a statement about possibility, but what uh, Jesus actually came to do. In John 6, 35, Jesus promised, all that the Father gives me will come to me. John 6, 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing. In John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In John 10, 14, I know my own, and my own know me. John 10, 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 16, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. And he's talking about the, the, the fold, the sheep pen of apostate Judaism. There were his sheep in that sheep pen, but there are other sheep pens like the ones we were in that Jesus would come and retrieve. I must bring them also, he says. They will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Again, these are declarative promises from Jesus about what would actually happen as a result of his death on behalf of his sheep. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me. In John 17, in that high priestly prayer, which just gives this magnificent view of inter-Trinitarian relationships and the unfolding plan of God's salvific redemption purpose, Jesus says this, John 17, 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give them eternal life. John 17, 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of this world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Jesus speaking of the 11 disciples at that point. John 17, 9, I ask on their behalf, that is, the 11 gathered there. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. There, Jesus is making to distinguish, uh, uh, is distinguishing in his high priestly prayer between his disciples given to him by the Father and the world. In John 17, 20, he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word. So again, that distinction holds. Jesus is praying in John 17 for the 11 true disciples gathered with him in that moment, and he's praying for everyone who will believe the gospel 
through their words, as opposed to everyone else. Acts 20, 28 says, the church of God is purchased with Jesus' own blood. Romans 3 tells us that uh, we are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood. That is what happens at the cross of Christ. Propitiation, that is divine wrath is satisfied by an innocent substitute. That actually happens at the cross, according to Romans 3.25. What is the result of that actuality? Redemption for all believers. That is the redeeming out of the slave market by the purchase price of the blood of the Son. These things are all actualities that take place and they are tied to the cross of Christ. This is significant because these things are presenting the cross of Christ not as an event that provides an opportunity, but as an event that actually accomplishes salvation, redemption, propitiation, reconciliation. Romans 5 says this, we have been justified by his blood. Romans 5.10, we are reconciled to God through the death of his son. 1 Corinthians 1.30, by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, Christ gave himself for our sins so that he would rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father. Why did Jesus go to the cross according to this verse? To actually rescue us from the present evil age according to the plan of God. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse himself. Listen to Ephesians 1, verse 4. God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, listen to this, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Do you see all of these election, predestination, foreknowledge, grand sweeping plan of God to the glory of God expressions of God's redemptive purposes for his people are all tied to the cross of Christ. These are all statements about what Jesus actually accomplished at the cross. Ephesians 2.15, he abolished in his flesh, that is, at the cross, the enmity. He reconciled them both, Jew and Gentile, in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. Again, these are things Jesus actually did at the cross. Ephesians 5, 25, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, set her apart, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Ephesians 5, 25, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her is a clear statement about Jesus' intent at the cross. Philippians 1.29, it has been granted for Christ's sake for you to believe in him. Now listen carefully to that statement. It has been granted to you for Christ's sake that you believe. In other words, belief is not a response that grabs hold of the opportunity that Jesus provided at the cross. Belief itself is a grace gift of God whereby he secures all his people. So belief, faith, repentance is a vehicle, but it is a vehicle God provides, God produces, and gives freely by his grace, whereby he secures the death of Christ and all his work for those who believe. 
Colossians 1.13. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. He transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1.22. He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. 1 Timothy 1.15. Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners. Not to merely provide an opportunity for sinners, but to actually save them. Titus 2.14, he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Titus 3.5, he saved us. Hebrews 9.12, through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews 9.14 says, The blood of Christ cleanses your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 9.15, Since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9.28, Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Hebrews 13.12, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore in his body our sins. On the cross. Jesus actually was the sin bearer for us at the cross. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died for sins once for all. And once for all there is, is all one word. It simply means once for all time. The just in the place of the unjust so that he would bring us to God. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And Revelation 5, 9 tells us that Jesus was slain, having purchased for God with his blood people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. What does all of this indicate for us? What is the testimony of Scripture about the people for whom Christ died, the purpose for which Christ died in keeping with the plan of God and the effectual results of the work of Christ at the cross? It means the design of God's salvific plan to purchase a people for his own possession is the same as the effect of that plan. Do you understand that? The, the design of the plan is the same as the effect of the plan. God elected some to salvation. He predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. He sent his son to pay the penalty for their sins. Jesus' death actually paid for those sins, resulting in actual justification, actual adoption, actual reconciliation, actual salvation. And bringing in the work of the Holy Spirit in regeneration, supernaturally producing repentance and faith. Where there was no spiritual life before and no ability to turn from sin to Christ, God's design was the same as the effect. His plan actually accomplished the salvation of his people. This is why we can say, God saves sinners. This is why we echo the refrain of the doxology in Romans 11, that from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever, amen. It is why we would agree with the no boasting clause of scripture. Salvation is all of grace so that no man may boast. God's salvation plan did not produce an equal opportunity option for everyone. By the way, if that is all that God did in his salvific plan, then no one would be saved. An offer of salvation to anyone who could produce a spiritual response out of a condition of spiritual death, that offer would go no farther than the offer of a milkshake in a cemetery. Who wants one? Nobody could want one. Consider for a moment inter-Trinitarian, or consider for a moment the Trinitarian participation in the salvation of sinners. Ephesians 1, the Father planned redemption. John 6, 65, the Father elected believers. John 3, 16, God sent the Son to the earth. Isaiah 53, 10, God crushed the Son at the cross. Acts 2, 24, God raised the Son from the dead. And John 14, 16, God the Father sent the Holy Spirit. 
What was the Son's participation in the redemption of sinners? He obeyed the Father, John 6, 38. He died as a substitute, 1 Peter 3, 18. He satisfied the wrath of God, Romans 3, 25. He rose from the dead, John 10, 17, and 18. And he raises believers from the dead, John 6, 40. And the Holy Spirit has a role in the salvation of sinners. He is said to have raised the Son from the dead, 1 Peter 3.18. He regenerates believers, John 6.63. He indwells believers, Romans 8, 9 to 11. He sanctifies believers, that is, brings them into progressive conformity into the likeness of Christ, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And he seals believers, guarantees them for the day of salvation, Ephesians 1.13. And we could also consider the intra-Trinitarian relationships and purposes in the salvation of sinners. We saw that a little bit earlier in John 17 in that high priestly prayer. What is going on between the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit in their agreed purposes to save sinners? The reality is that God in his Trinitarian being and in his perfect purposes and plans before the foundation of the world decided to save sinners and as time and history and the salvific plan unfolds, he actually does that very thing. The effect is the same as the plan. The contention of the particular redemption position is simply that God did everything required to bring undeserving sinners into a right relationship with himself. I will tell you, that these verses have been in my Bible my whole life. I read them, I believed them, and at a period in my life, I was not ready to embrace a particular redemption idea because there were other verses. H have you felt that way in thinking through the cross of Christ or if you've ever pondered the question, for whom did Christ die? And maybe you were like me and you felt like thinking, well, if Jesus only died for some, if he only died for the many, if he only laid down his life for his sheep, what about the goats? What about the world? What about every human being who ever lived past, present, and future? Is that fair? Have you asked that question? Have you perhaps been constrained by texts of Scripture that have a big, broad view of things tied to the cross of Christ? If you're feeling that way even this morning, I want you to know that you're in good company. And as we said before, we must never move a theological position in a way that runs over texts of Scripture. If there is a verse in my Bible, I must believe it. And so, Bible verses that seem to answer the question, for whom did Christ die, in a different way than what I just presented, can't be easily dismissed. We, we can't get into an arm wrestling match where I've got my Bible verses over here for my position, and you've got your Bible verses over here for your position, and we're going to see who has the most Bible verses. That's not how the Bible works. This is one book written by one author, and he doesn't disagree with himself. So I want to put in front of you some what I might label universal atonement texts. And I, I don't mean that to contravene everything I've said up to this point. Um, I, I put that a little bit in quotes, but I, I still call it that because these were the verses that were binding my conscience uh, from embracing everything that I just described in terms of a particular redemption. So I'm not going to read all of them for you. I'll just point out some that sort of give headings for a series of texts in our Bible. Revelation 5.9. They sang a new song, worthy are you, Jesus, to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you might be thinking, well, didn't you just read that verse under the particular redemption stack of Bible verses? Yes, I did. And <laughs> I'm reading it here too, because every tongue and tribe and nation just, it seems so big and it's tied to what God purposed in sending his son to the cross. Right? And, and, and so we can focus on a portion of a verse that points to the bigness of what Christ did, the universality of what Christ did, and maybe miss some of the details about purchasing, um, and maybe some of the details about men specified rather than every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. 
But, but the, the feel of a verse like Revelation 5-9 constrained me in significant ways to think about the bigness and broadness of the scope of the death of Jesus. And, and I just want to say as we walk through these verses, my goal is not to knock them down. Uh, my goal is to lift these verses up because we cannot think about the death of Christ if you find yourself moving from a general atonement view to a particular redemption view. Don't do this. I used to think the cross of Christ was very big. Now I think it's really small. No, that's not the point. We don't want to run away from the bigness of texts that are actually trying to indicate the bigness and broadness and depth and surprising objects of God's actual love for sinners. We'll come to that more in a moment. Listen to 1 John 2, 2. Jesus himself is the propitiation for our sins, right? Remember propitiation, satisfaction of divine wrath by an innocent substitute. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and listen to this, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Right? 1 John 2.2 2 is going to be a, a sort of a heading for a category of texts that use the word world tied to the death of Christ. Okay, and we'll look at 1 John 2.2 2 a little bit later as sort of a way to, to think about those verses. 1 John 1.29, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is another world passage. 1 Timothy 4.10 says, For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Now, this is one we could spend more time in. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one later, so I'm going to give you the, the hint at understanding 1 Timothy 4.10. In fact, if you want to open your Bibles and turn there for just a moment, put your eyes on this. A couple of statements are made. We labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God. And then listen to these two statements. Who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. So we have the, this phrase, Jesus is the Savior of all men. And all is another word we'll talk about in just a moment, similar to the word world. Um, and we'll have to think through how is the word all used in Scripture and how does it relate to this question, for whom did Christ die? Um, but I want you to key in on a word there in that verse, especially, especially. And when you hear the word especially, um, you probably think subset. And what I mean by that is I love all ice cream, especially vanilla. That, did that sound boring? Was that a bad example? Should I have said um, Baskin and Robbins mint chocolate chip with the really finely flecked chocolate chips in there? Or should I have picked something? No, vanilla is important because vanilla is not just like plain. It's a flavor. It comes from the vanilla beans in Madagascar, and, and now they're starting to grow them in Papua New Guinea as well. And you crush those things up and put them in there. There's hardly a better flavor. Why am I talking about vanilla? Doesn't matter. I like ice cream, especially vanilla, uh, can be subset. You could take that to mean I like every flavor of ice cream there is out there, um, and I have a, a really special place in my heart for vanilla. Okay, I could be saying that. Now, if you've been to Lili's, do you know Lili's? They have some ice cream flavors in there. Have you, have you perused the ice cream aisle at Lili's Market? I mean, red bean ice cream and corn and cheese ice cream. Have you seen those? All of a sudden, this statement, I love all ice cream, goes out the window. <laughs> I might mean something else. And so when you see the word especially, we, I think the way we use it in English today, it always feels like subset. I'm making this blanket statement about everything and within that all the stuff that I love, there's this other one I want to talk about that I also love. But there's another way to think about especially, and it is not subset, but it is narrowing focus. I love ice cream. What am I driving at? I want you to have better feelings about vanilla than you already have. I, I'm thinking about vanilla. In fact, I'm thinking about Bluebell's homemade vanilla. That's what I have in mind. And, and I, I want to convince you to run out to Fry's, even if it's not on sale, buy a tub of Bluebell's homemade vanilla ice cream and try it and see if you like what I like. 
I made a statement about, about ice cream. I love ice cream, but what I'm thinking about and what I'm going to drive you toward is something much more particular, much more specific. And the word for especially in your Greek text is the word melista. And I've just been sort of test driving every use of the word melista for about five years in the Greek New Testament and asking the question of every passage where it's used, does melista, or the English especially, does it mean subset or does it mean narrowing focus? A broad statement is made. Now I'm going to tell you particularly what I mean by that broad statement. And I think Melista holds up in every single use as narrowing focus rather than subset. So this is the hint at understanding 1 Timothy 4.10. For this we labor and strive. We fixed our hope on the living God who is the savior of all men. And we'll come back to the word all in a moment. Particularly, Melista, especially, I, I want you to know what I'm talking about when I say savior of all men. Um, particularly, believers. And if we understand Melista in that sense, narrowing focus rather than subset, all of a sudden, 1 Timothy 4.10 becomes a text about particular redemption rather than having the feel of Jesus died for every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. John 3.16 and you know this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We're going to diagram this uh, a little bit later this morning and, um, and take a look at John 3.16. But that was one that bound my conscience. I can't go to a particular redemption view if John 3.16 is still in my Bible. Um, so I needed to come to a, an understanding of that verse. Second Peter 2 1 uh, talks about those who deny the master who bought them and go to eternal destruction. So uh, what's interesting, there's a category of verses about those who, from appearances, look like Christians, talk like Christians, sound like Christians, and then go away from Christ. And they go to eternal destruction. And there are texts that seem to say Jesus died for those. And I think the, the reality there is, yes, it seemed that Jesus died for them. I, I think that's the way we need to understand that heading of verses. A similar one to that is 1 Corinthians 8, 11. Don't ruin a brother. Bring, bring, a, bring a professing believer to eternal ruin by you being a stumbling block. Um, and, and, and that one is one for whom Christ died. That is a verse that's uh, employed sometimes to, to say, see, people who go to destruction were those for whom Christ died. Um, I don't think that's the right reading of 1 Corinthians 8, 11. Romans 14, 15 is similar. Listen to this passage, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And now that, that brings in the word all we'll get to in a moment later. What, is, what does the author mean by the word all? Does he mean every human being who ever lived past, present, and future? Or does he mean all the ones he's talking about? Or does he mean all kinds? We'll, we'll come to those uses of the word all. But you also have in Second Peter a, a discussion about the will of God. And this is a theology proper question for God to have um, several aspects of things he desires. There is, of course, the will of God, which is bound up in his counsels and his purposes, which is inviolable. And then God also has a desire that human agents do things in accordance with his moral precepts. And human agents don't always do those things. Are you saying God doesn't always get what he wants? Well, yes, in one sense. But in another sense, God always gets everything he wants. Uh, we're talking about two different aspects of what God wants. It is appropriate for God to want you to not sin today. He wants that. Does he get that? Will he get that from us in this room? Well, no. <laughs> we will sin today. Uh, so just thinking through the will of God in terms of um, a right understanding of God's uh, prescriptive will, his descriptive will, what are his precepts for his people um, versus what are his plans and purposes from the foundation of the world. Titus 2.11 says, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Boy, again, that sounds like just a great big verse about the death of Christ for every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. The problem with that verse is it says it brings salvation to all men. 
So if we want all to mean every human being, past, present, and future, then we've actually merged into universalism rather than a universal atonement view, which is just the question for whom did Jesus die? Uh, but those verses for me felt like Jesus had to die for everybody because it, it says salvation to all men. Titus 3, 4, the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind. Uh, 1 Timothy 2 says God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Colossians 1, 20 uh, says that through the death of Christ, he reconciles all things to himself and makes peace through the blood of his cross. Well, in what sense is everything reconciled to God through Christ? In what sense is peace made through the blood of Christ's cross? Well, we believers understand the uh, Romans 5.1 version of that piece. We were at enmity with God, but now having been justified by his blood through faith, we possess peace with God. We're on good terms with him. But there is a biblical notion of peace bound up in the word shalom, which is God's powerful peace, his peace through superior firepower, that he will bring about where even his enemies feign obedience during his earthly reign, and where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. He will bring peace and he will settle the books, that is, reconcile all things to himself. He truly is the victor, and to him belong the spoils. Jesus wins. Peace does not mean, well, that's good for everybody. If you're on the wrong side of Jesus, when he gets his peace, when the Lord has his day, uh, that will not be good if you're still in your sin. So peace and reconciliation there are a bigger concept than just forgiveness of sin. Hebrews 2.9 tells us that by the grace of God, Jesus would taste death for everyone. And the question is, who's the everyone? Does that mean every human being who ever lived past, present, and future? Or every one of the ones for whom he came to taste death? 2 Corinthians 5, 14, and 15, one died for all. John 12, 32, I will draw all men to myself, Jesus says. John 6, 33, the bread of God comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. John 6, 51, I will give for the life of the world my flesh. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Romans eleven thirty two, 32, he shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. John 4, 42, calls Jesus the savior of the world. In John 12, he says, I will draw all men to myself. In John, 1 John 4, 14, the son is called the savior of the world. I left out a bunch of verses there that give similar ideas, either that God desires everybody to be saved or that uh, Jesus died for the world or he died for all or everyone. Uh, these are categories of texts that ought to constrain us, make us think and pause and ask some important questions. Let me give you just a few hermeneutical reminders. It's important, number one, to positively assert the intent of every one of those so-called universalist passages. Don't avoid the language of world and all and everybody and every tongue and tribe and nation and people. Don't replace the word world in your Bible with the word elect. Don't replace the word all in your Bible with the predestined to be conformed. God actually means something by those words, and he wants to convey something in those words. But we don't flatten those words out to make, the conf make them conform to our theological articulation of a right doctrine. No, every verse needs to speak for itself. And if God wants to say world, he wants to do so for a reason. If he wants to say all and everybody, he wants to do so for a reason. If God wants to express his mercy, maybe even indiscriminate mercy, to a world of sinners, um, we need to let those things speak. So first and foremost, let the passages say what they say. It's never enough to simply say that this passage doesn't mean what it says. <laughs> No, we don't want to go down that road. Uh, we, we don't have the, the privilege or the luxury of uh, making our Bible's words conform to our systems, our lenses. No, we want God's bias. We want God's intent. This is why in hermeneutics, the study of the Bible, we're aiming at <clears throat> authorial intent. What did the little a author intend by what the little a author said? The human author. And what did the capital A author intend by what the capital A author said through the little a human author? And by the way, those intentions are the same. 
there is one meaning from God superintending his word to the human author being the instrument of that word. A third hermeneutical reminder is that context is critical for determining meaning. That's going to be helpful with words. It's going to be helpful with grammar. And a fourth principle here, defining words is critical for determining authorial intent. And, and there are technical words in our Bibles, and there are flexible words in our Bibles. A technical word is a word in your Bible that kind of just means one thing whenever it's used. And there are flexible words in our Bible that have an array of meanings, and context is going to help us understand which of the meanings is intended by the author. You don't get to just decide your favorite definition of a Bible word, look it up in a dictionary. Hey, this word has 20 different uses. I like that one, and I'm going to insert that into this passage. You will no longer have the meaning of the passage, and therefore you don't have the passage. The meaning of the text is bound up in, or the, the power of God's word in the text is bound up in the meaning of the text. If you don't have God's meaning, you don't have God's word in a passage. The Bible's not some magical book of incantation. If we play around with the words and say it just right, something happens. No, this is God's self-disclosure. This is his revelation. So we need his mind in it. So defining words appropriate to their context is important. All right, let's look at a couple of key words, the word all and the word world. The word all in uh, some of my uh, previous theological context, I heard this phrase, all means all, and all is all ever means. Have you heard that? Have you said that? Um, and, and we're just supposed to know by that that, that all means all. Okay, well, that didn't, that didn't help me. <laughs> what does all mean? It's sort of circular. Um, and the intent in that statement is related specifically to the question for whom did Christ die? And the answer to that question is Christ died for every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. That's what all means. Some texts that employ all to defend a universal atonement, um, we went through already, but Jesus is the Savior of all men, 1 Timothy 4.10. Um, 2 Peter 3.9, God wishes for all to come to repentance. Titus 2.11, salvation to all men. Uh, 1 Timothy 2. Um, Christ Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all, uh, et cetera. Um, I want you to put your eyes on a couple of passages. Um, go to Matthew 10, 22. And I don't think it'll take us very long to demonstrate that um, all means all and all is all ever means uh, doesn't hold up very long. In fact, if you just take an exhaustive concordance, that's a, that's a reference book that just lists words in alphabetical order and tells you everywhere they're found in the Bible. And you just look up the word all, and you just read all the passages where all is used, you're going to discover very quickly that all does not mean every human being who ever lived past, present, and future, or some exhaustive uh, description of everything that could be named. <clears throat> Matthew 10, 22, you will be hated by all because of my name. Jesus said. Who's the all? You're going to be hated by every human being who ever lived past, present, and future? Well, no, that's not what Jesus intends there. Um, well, we're going to discover that all can mean all without exception, meaning every single thing that could be named, or all without distinction, meaning all kinds, all varieties, a large assortment of kinds of things, or all can mean all all the ones I'm talking about, or all can have a specific referent in a context that makes it clear who the all is. So those are some of the categories. Um, John 18, 20, I'll just say a couple more of these. Um, Jesus answered, I've spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. Um, does he mean there every Jew who ever lived past, present, and future? No. Does he mean every Jew in Israel in that day? No, of course not. Does he mean every Jew in Jerusalem? No. Um, there's a certain all that Jesus intended in that statement. Romans 5.18. As through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men. Oh, see, there condemnation to all men. I got that. Yeah, of course. Everybody's condemned. That means every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. Um, except for Jesus. 
He was human. So we've got to make at least one exception. But the verse continues, listen to this, so that through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. And unless you're a universalist, believing everybody goes to heaven, that second half of that verse, all, does not mean every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. Romans 11.32, God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Um, let's do one more, one more here. Um, 2 Timothy 2.10, for this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they may obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Um, what all things did Paul endure for the sake of the elect that they might believe? Well, all the things he endured. Paul endured all the things he endured. Um, by saying all, he doesn't mean Paul endured every single thing that's ever happened, every single thing that could have happened. Um, he simply means all the things that he did endure. I endured all the things that I endured, is what Paul means by all there. It should be clear, and there are many other examples, um, that things intended by all does not mean absolutely all things without exception. Um, all can mean that from time to time. Um, but all also can mean all things without distinction or all kinds of things or all the things to which the author refers in the immediate context. So let's, uh, let's walk through uh, one example. First uh, Timothy chapter 2. And, and this is where we get our verse, 1 Timothy 2, 4. God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And, and this sounds like one of these universalist passages. Uh, either God desires all men to be saved, but they don't. Why don't they? Well, because they don't believe. And salvation is left up to the ability of unregenerate man to produce something only the Spirit can produce. Or we come to a discussion of Paul's use of the word all. God desires all men to be saved. Now, go back up to verse 1. First of all, do you see the word all there in verse 1? <laughs> we're in trouble already. Um, we're in trouble already because this is 1 Timothy chapter 2. It, it's not the first thing Paul's written in 1 Timothy. It's not the first thing Paul's written. It's not the first thing he said. It's not the first thing he's wanted to declare to Timothy in this very letter. So all doesn't mean... All without exception here. They keep going. I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. Paul to Timothy, tell the Ephesian believers in the church that you're uh, pastoring right now that they have to pray for every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. I don't think that's what Paul intends. All without exception doesn't fit here. Timothy and the Ephesian believers were not to pray for Filipinos in the 21st century. Um, they weren't to pray for ancient Egyptians who were already dead. Um, this must mean something different than all without exception. I believe this means all without distinction. Uh, notice how this verse goes. Um, pray on behalf of all kinds of men. Uh, Timothy, don't discriminate in your prayers. Don't exclude people from your prayers. Make entreaties. Go before the Lord and pray for all kinds of people, all categories of people. And Timothy, you're tempted to not pray for some. You know those overlords, kings, people who are in authority, that boss you don't like, uh, that husband who makes your life miserable. Timothy didn't have a husband. Clarification, just categories. People in authority over you. You, 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 don't want to, you, don't, you don't want to pray for those. Yes, you, you, you need to pray and encourage believers to pray for all kinds, for kings and all who are in authority. And, and again, Paul here is not encouraging Timothy to pray for every king who would ever come, every authority figure, every mid-level bureaucrat that would ever exist in every government on the earth for all time, but all kinds who are in authority. So that, and what's the purpose here? So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. It's really hard to be a rebel rouser when you're praying for the salvation of bad guys who are in authority over you, right? Because your complaints, man, they're making my life hard. I wish God would come down and avenge his uh, anger on them. You know, you're praying imprecatory prayers against your boss or against the president or whatever. And Paul says, no, pray for them. Why? What does that produce? 
tranquility, godliness, totally different disposition to bad authority. And then he says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. And he impresses upon Timothy the idea that God is a Savior. He wants to save, and he wants to save sinners. He already told Timothy that when Paul was one who was in authority and was a bad guy, Christ Jesus came to save one like him. Even as an example, that if God could save the Apostle Paul, if God could save Saul of Tarsus, God could save anybody. So, don't discriminate in your prayer. Pray for everybody. Notice what he says next. God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Again, stay with the same all. All kinds, all varieties. Don't discriminate. God's going to draw to himself a people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. And not many noble, yes, but not many. He didn't say not any. There would be kings and those who authority and, and bad husbands and terrible bosses and evil tyrants who would bow the knee to Christ in repentance and faith rather than bowing the knee to Christ at the end of time by forced submission and God's shalom. So pray for them. Again, we looked at this a couple weeks ago. Prayer and evangelism are God's means for bringing people to himself. All right, let's move ahead to the word world. The word world is often invoked, like the word all, in key passages to insist that Jesus died for everyone. And, and if we just insert the word or, or the, the definition for world, every human being who ever lived past, present, and future, then we're going to come up with the idea that Jesus died for everybody in the same way. That he accomplished an equal opportunity redemption for everybody to be secured on the condition that spiritually dead people do something they can't do. I don't think that's what the word world means, and, and I've included in the notes, and if you want them, uh, every use of the word world in the New American Standard Bible, along with the dictionary, the English, Englishified Greek dictionary uses of the word world so you can see it for yourself, um, there are 20 different definitions of the word world in the Bible, and none of them mean every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. The word world sometimes means the Roman Empire. It sometimes means the anti-God religious system uh, that is fostered and blinded by Satan in whom all of us are trapped and need to be rescued from. And we need to think about the way the author uses the word world. Remember, the same author of John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that same author, the Apostle John, also said, do not love the world or the things in the world. Do you understand the word world is a flexible term? And often in the Gospel of John, it's bound up in this anti-God religious system. It's big, yes, that's the big part of the word world. It's also bad. And I want you to turn to John chapter 3 and, and set ourselves in this context for just a moment. We can skip ahead to the um, diagram here. I don't know if this will be visible. Look, there's a bunch of scribbles up there on a screen on a whiteboard. You can have this if you email me uh, for the notes. Um, you have on the left side uh, a line diagram of John 3.16 in English, and on the right side uh, the same line diagram with the Greek text up there. And, and I just want you to be able to see visually what John 3.16 is doing. Um, think about the context of John 3. Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus. Remember Nick? Nicodemus came to him by night. He was a Pharisee. Jesus referred to him as the teacher of Israel. He's something of a head honcho. We know something about the Pharisaical mindset, the Pharisaical male mindset in Jesus' day. Prayers are recorded of Pharisees praying things like this. Dear Lord, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile. Interesting start to a prayer. I thank you that I'm not a woman, and I thank you that I am a Pharisee. See, Nicodemus came from a brand of people that were xenophobic, misogynistic, and elitist. It means they hated non-Jews, despised women, and thought they were the cream of the crop. And the Pharisaical mindset was that when Messiah came, he would reward the Pharisees for holding the line holding up Mosaic law, keeping the people under their thumb, doing the things they were supposed to do, <clears throat> that Jesus would come and he would have the Pharisees sit with him in his kingdom and dine with him because Messiah loved the Pharisees. That was their view. That was their anticipation, their expectation. 
And so when Jesus comes to Nicodemus, or Nicodemus comes to him by night and asks him questions, and Jesus says this statement, among many shocking statements in the dialogue, God loved the Pharisees. Nicodemus was God is reward. Yep, that's exactly why Messiah. Yep, you're the Messiah. You live up to my standards of what Messiah should be. You came here for me. Good job. No, that is not what John 3.16 says. <laughs> and there is debate over whether the quotation marks end, if you're reading a red letter Bible, is this John the Baptist, or John uh, the Revelator, John the, what, what is he called? John the Apostle uh, writing, narrating, or is this Jesus still talking in John 3.16? There's debate about that. Neither, neither view takes away from what's happening here. God so loved the world. That is, God sent his son, Nicodemus, sent the Messiah not to reward the Pharisees for being elitist, misogynistic xenophobes. He actually came to love way more broadly than you're thinking. And the problem is much worse than you're thinking. By world, I believe God means here big and bad. Big and bad. Nicodemus, the salvation plan of God through Messiah is bigger than you think it is, and God came to save people badder than you think they are. You think you're the best, and you need to be born again. You don't have what it takes. Your religious pedigree, your intellectual attainments, and your uh, heritage do not qualify you for entrance into the kingdom. You have to start over, Nicodemus, and you're the teacher of Israel. Shouldn't you know these things? The conversation in John 3 is remarkable on so many counts. It, it helps us understand what Jesus is saying when we back away from automatically assuming world means every human being who ever lived past, present, and future into the realm of being a confrontation of Nicodemus's thought patterns, self-absorbed, elitist, exclusionary. God's love is much bigger than this, and the targets of his love are far worse sinners than you think humanity is capable of. Um, let's look at the grammar of John 3.16 for just a little bit. Think about um, three uh, clauses to begin with. God loved world. That's the main idea. God loved world. The big, bad, awful, surprising target of God's love is different than you think, Nicodemus. It's a world of sinners out there. The word so, God so loved the world. I used to think this so was like so much. Oh, God loved the world so much that the world is so cute and he just so loves it. Songs have been written about the so in John 3.16. It's not so much. It is the Greek word hutos and it simply means in this manner. God loved the world in this manner. In what manner? That he gave. God did something very particular out of his love for a great big world of terrible, awful people. God gave his son. And gave isn't like a Christmas gift wrapped with a bow. God crushed his son. God crushed his son. Um, God loved world. In what manner? That he crushed his son so that. What is the so that? What is the purpose that God is driving at here? Um, whoever believes will have eternal life. Whosoever believes. Whosoever will believe. Sometimes that is translated. We see the word will there. Ah, free will. It's right there in John 3.16. The word will is not in John 3.16. Whosoever and whoever are good translations if we understand them rightly. They represent a participial phrase, which is simply all the believing ones in him all the believing ones in him, that's what whoever means. It's right to say, so whoever believes. Here, here's an invitation. Whoever believes, that's whom God uh, loved and crushed his son for. To, to what purpose? That all the believing ones in him, two results, will not perish. They will absolutely not perish. And they will have eternal life. They will actually possess it. When you think through the vocabulary of John 3.16, the structure of John 3.16, this becomes actually a very particular verse with the unfolding, unbreakable chain of God's redemptive plan for some very bad people. 
for me, thinking through the details of texts like John 3.16, 1 John 2.20, I know we didn't get to that one. Uh, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, not only ours, but the whole world. Just here's a clue. We're, we're not going to extend this anymore. We're going to move on to irresistible grace next week. But in thinking through 1 John 2.20, propitiation, technical word, four times in the New Testament, means a satisfaction of divine wrath by a substitute every time it's used. And the word world, flexible world with 20 different meanings. Don't make the flexible world undefined, flexible word, undefined the technical word. Okay, that's your clue. You can go look at 1 John 2.20 in its context. But I just want, to, want you to understand that when you look at the details of these verses, these big Bible verses about the scope of Jesus' death do not undermine the particular focus of Jesus actually accomplishing salvation for his people. These things go together. Uh, there's some work to be done in the details of texts to make sure we're not having a fight with God's word against God's word. They go together. Um, and, and if you're anything like me, this was a wrestling match that, that took time, took years, frankly. And so, um, again, you can have the notes uh, if you'd like them. Um, if, if you are wrestling through this, uh, my encouragement to you is just be overwhelmed by the wonderful reality that Jesus paid for your sins. That's the bottom line. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, what does it mean that Jesus came and died for me? That's just a critical love that, or a, a critical reality that secures not only our eternal lives, but our affections and love and appreciation for the gospel in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for what you have done to save sinners. May we glory in, may we sing about, may we never grow weary of proclaiming Jesus' death in our place. And to you be the glory. Amen.